Fasted cardio may not be worth it if your overall goal is just getting better at cardio. Or is it? Because when you look at the data, it's actually kind of interesting. So when we look specifically at cardio, okay, we're not talking about resistance training here. We're not talking about peak power or explosiveness. We're talking about maybe a little fat burning, maybe a little cardiovascular health, you know, going out for a run. The regular person, you're going out for a jog, you're going out for a walk. Does it actually matter or is it really splitting hairs? Well, I want to open with an interesting study that took a look at fasted versus fed cardio. In this case, it was ranging from 45 minutes before cardio to four hours before cardio having food. And we can assume that anything over four hours at this point is considered fasted. Okay, what was interesting is this was a large body of data. They found that 11 studies found that there was a slight improvement in aerobic performance in a fed state. But 14 of the studies found no difference. No difference whatsoever. And when you're coming down to just like getting healthy, good stuff for the circulatory system, you could really make the argument, it just doesn't matter. Like it really just doesn't. But there's other things that we need to look at too. We need to look at actual adaptation. Now, if you talk to Peter Atia, who I had on my channel, and we talked specifically about this for quite a while, and I've done videos on this, one of the largest predictive indicators of basically good health, and also one of the largest risk factors, is going to be low or high VO2 max, right? So like if you have a low VO2 max and you're in that tertile, compared to those that have a high VO2 max, the high VO2 max on paper lives longer. Like they have better longevity, better health outcomes. And it's one of the most solid pieces of data that we can look at. So then you say, okay, well, maybe it does matter how much I can improve my VO2 max with my workouts or with my running or with my training or with my cardio. Let's forget fat loss for just a second. There was a study that was published in the Journal of Science in Sports and Medicine. And this is going to be very interesting because what it found is that when you look at fasted cardio or fasted aerobic work, there was a greater improvement in VO2 max. Okay, that doesn't mean a greater absolute VO2 max, but a greater adaptation to VO2 max and greater glycogen concentration at rest. Sounds like complicated gobbledygook, but what does that have to do for longevity? Like, does it matter with longevity? Well, it does because if you can adapt more and get more VO2 max, then you can train at a higher threshold and train at that VO2 max higher. Let me put it into a simple way. Let's pretend for a second you had an amazing like device that could like restrain your heart and lungs so that you could train it like a weight vest. Like you go into a gym, you put a weight vest on, you can like do push-ups and get stronger or something, right? Let's pretend there's this magical device you can put on your heart and you put on your lungs and it's like trains your heart and lungs, makes it a little harder, right? So that when you do run, you're, it's harder. Well, then when you remove that device, you're gonna be like, ah, I'm liberated, I can run so much faster and you can perform better and ultimately even get higher in your VO2 max, right? So this is the same kind of theory. Essentially, the fasted training triggers a better fitness adaptation to increase your VO2 max. But what good is this increase if you don't occasionally tap into it in a fed state? So for cardio for longevity, although there isn't an absolute clinical trial for me to say this is the absolute way, based upon the literature, it makes sense that doing some fasted training is going to trigger a strong adaptation and then occasionally doing fed training and fed cardio is going to allow you to improve glucose utilization and reduce glucose levels and be better at glu overall better glucose tolerance. Now, let's take another route for just a second. In a fasted state, there is more AMPK phosphorylation. I've talked about this before, but essentially when you're doing cardio, again, I'm using running as an example, but you go out for a run and let's say you had a little bit of food before. You have to kind of burn through that fuel before you can start to phosphorylate AMPK a whole lot okay? Because it's all dependent on your relative deficit, right? But if you start out that run and you're fasted, you're going to already be having AMPK phosphorylation. I'll explain what this really means. And then as you run more, it's like you're turning AMPK up even more, which means you're getting more adaptation. 
AMPK is what signals adaptations to occur from nutrient deprivation, right? So when you don't eat, AMPK flips on and it starts releasing fat and it does all these other things. In a fasted state and you go for a run, you're essentially cranking that up even more. So it's happening at a faster rate. But more is not always better. But where this comes into application is there is a downstream effect of AMPK phosphorylation in what is called a sirtuin. Okay, and sirtuin, we see Dr. David Sinclair talking about this all the time. And some people subscribe to this theory, some people don't, but one thing is for certain, increased sirtuin 1, sirt 1, is a good thing for cellular health. Longevity, again, we could fight back and forth on that, but it seems to be very promising. Now, sirtuin 1s are going to impact FOXO3, they're going to impact PGC1A, all these things develop more mitochondrial density, okay? But in order for sirtuin-1 to actually have this positive effect, and in order for it to actually trigger some of the results that we want, we need to have available NAD. We need to have this nicotinamide adenide dinucleotide. Okay, that is the fundamental, like, currency, fuel, in a way, for, like, cellular activity. Like, without NAD, we'd be dead in 15 seconds, okay? So some of the ways that you can support this, I put a link down below for a company called Verso that has a product that has what's called NMN in it, as well as transresveratrol. Okay, it's called their cell being. So nicotinamide mononucleotide is talked about a lot in the longevity circles because it indirectly may help support higher NAD levels. What does this mean in the case of like this video? Does, is it relevant? It means that the same way that cardio could be good for longevity, NMN could be good for longevity somewhat indirectly. By making NAD more available, you can activate more sirtuins, potentially activating more sirtuins with your cardio, potentially activating more sirtuins with fasting, potentially activating more sirtuins with caloric deprivation, right? So I put a link down below. That's a 15% off discount link down below. So I highly recommend you check them out. If you're focused on longevity, and you don't just have to take my word for it, you can go on their site and you can read testimonials, you can read the references, because NMN is something that is talked about a lot, and especially in tandem with transresveratrol. So again, it's called Verso. That link is down below. If you do fasted training or you do fasting or you're focused on longevity, it's worth a shot. So check them out in the top line of the description down below. What's interesting though is when you look at fed training, fed training increased the time to exhaustion. Okay, so when you fuel, you can go for longer. So then you have to ask yourself the question is how long is your cardio? Okay, so we now know that when you're doing fasted cardio, you have these adaptations that occur that might be good for longevity. We also know, based upon the scientific literature, that when you fast and train, and again, you don't have to be intermittent fasting, but fasted training is going to have a higher concentration of circulating fatty acids to be burned. As a matter of fact, there's a study that looked at carbohydrates 45 minutes before a workout or a placebo drink 45 minutes before a workout, and they found that the carbohydrate drink actually did lead to slightly more peak power, peak wattage during cardio, but the fed group ended up having a significantly higher amount of fatty acid oxidation. So what that means is that they were burning more fat as a fuel source, and the decrease in power in the fasted state wasn't quite enough to really not justify it. It's not like it was 500 watts versus 200 watts peak power. We're talking 346 versus 332. A significant amount of wattage, but not enough to be like, oh, well, that's a game changer, right? However, the fatty acid oxidation rates were 0.33 in the fed group versus 0.46 in the fasted group. So more benefit to training fasted as far as fat oxidation than benefit to training fed for performance, right? So it kind of skews me towards, okay, maybe being fasted is a little bit better, even though I'd sacrifice a little bit of power. What I'm ultimately getting at with this is that just like training with a weight vest is good for your strength, training fasted in a cardio sense is sort of like adding a weight vest for your insides. But what about the stress? Like, is it bad on the body? Is that too much stress? And that is a viable consideration. Like, it is a stressful thing on your body. 
So my recommendation is this, and this is not based on any scientific literature specifically, it's based on more my experience and sort of the amount of data I have accumulated over the years in my brain. If it's going to be zone one or zone two, where you're predominantly using fat as a fuel source anyway, you might as well be fasted. It's low enough intensity where you're not really taxing anything. You're not gonna break down muscle. You're not, it's not a concern. Are you gonna burn more absolute fat? As a percentage, you will, but it's probably still negligible, but it's still good for the adaptation and good for the mitochondria. So I would recommend just rolling out of bed and doing that. But as you start getting into zone three, like the moderate range, maybe going for a jog, I think you should do 50-50. I think you should try doing some days fasted and some days fed. And don't worry about your subjective feeling on it. Just do it to do it. Some days you'll feel like crap fasted, some days you'll feel like crap fed, some days you'll feel great fasted, sometimes you'll feel great fed. Don't dwell on it too much. Then when it comes down to the more extreme stuff, the intervals, the high intensity stuff, in that case, I would recommend that you do maybe one out of every four workouts fasted. So we want just enough to get an adaptation, but not so much that we're adding additional stress to our body. The goal is not to just do it. It's to be optimal, okay? So you need adaptation, performance, adaptation, performance. So the higher the intensity that you go, the less frequently I would recommend doing it fasted. The lower the intensity, the more often I think you can get away with doing it fasted. Because when you look at longevity, it's not just about what are you doing to the cells, it's about how long you can actually do it throughout your lifetime too. So factor all of that stuff in. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.